chose for our group presentation is uh, the SR-71, uh, the Blackbird that was designed by Lockheed and it was developed in the late 50s and was developed for flight over Mach 3 which is the speed of sound and was made for the quick reach of high altitude and high speed. Uh, the first flight was taken in 1964 and only 32 were ever made of the SR-71. Uh, 10 of those crashed so it was only about 22 alive or left uh, this plane was retired in 1998 but is now getting a sequel made to it called the SR-72 and is due to be released in 2025 and the SR-72 is expected to make well over 4,000 miles per hour which will make it the newest fastest plane in the world and is also expected to reach a higher altitude uh, the SR-71 is known as the fastest aircraft in the world right now with a top speed of 2,193 miles per hour and reaches the highest altitude and fastest speed without rocket propulsion. If it detected a missile, it would just have to full throttle and it would lose sight of the missile and, and uh, not be detected. <clears throat> uh, the cockpit for this plane was designed for two people. You have the pilot in the front and on the rear, the rear top of the plane um, is the person who navigates and operates all the systems in it. Uh, the plane or the aircraft was painted a dark blue, almost a black, to increase the emission of eternal heat and to act as a camouflage against the night sky. Uh, the dark color led to aircraft's nickname Blackbird. Uh, while the SR-71 called radar carried radar countermeasures to evade interception efforts, its greatest protection was its combination of high altitude and very high speed which almost made it uh, invulnerable, which means it could pretty much go uh, flee any missile that's heading towards it. Along with its low radar cross-section, these qualities give a very short time for an enemy surface, surface to air missile to acquire and track the aircraft on radar. Uh, the SR-71 was powered by two Pratt & Whitney J58 axial flow turbine engines. And the J-58 was a considerable innovation of the era capable of producing a static thrust of 32,500 pounds. And the engine was most efficient around Mach 3.2. The Blackbird's typical cruising speed, which is what makes the plane so unique. The air inlets allowed the SR-71 to cruise at over Mach 3.2 with the air slowing down to subsonic, subsonic speed as it entered the engine. Uh, this has a unique compressor blade bleed to the afterburner which gave increased thrust at higher speeds and because of the wide speed range of the aircraft the engine needed two modes of operation to take you from stationary on the ground to 2000 miles per hour at high at high altitude uh, it was a conventional afterburning turbojet for takeoff and acceleration to mach 2 and then use permanent compressor bleed to the afterburner above mach 2 to get those higher speeds The J-58 was a one-of-a-kind engine. Uh, its unique trick involved in the ability to transition from a turbojet engine to the turbo ramjet engine in flight, um, sucking in vast amounts of oxygen-rich air and burning it to drastically increase each engine output. Um, each J-58 could generate up to 32,000 pounds of thrust in afterburner mode. A uh, spectacular feature for an engine that was designed in the late 50s. Uh, the J-58 made the SR-71 the fastest air breathing plane ever and uh, in the 90s the SR-71 flew from LA to Washington DC in about 65 minutes and it was going at an average speed of 2100 miles per hour. 
On most aircraft, the use of titanium was limited by the cost involved. It was generally used only in components exposed to the highest temperatures, such as exhaust bearings and the leading edges on the wings. On the SR-71, titanium was used for 85% of the structure, with much of the rest polymer composite materials. To control costs, Lockheed used a more easily worked titanium alloy which softened at a lower temperature. The challenges posed led Lockheed to develop new fabrication methods, which have since been used in the manufacture of other aircraft. Lockheed found out that washing welded titanium requires distilled water, as the chlorine present in tap water is corrosive, and cadmium-plated tools could not be used, as they also cause corrosion due to dissimilar metals. Metallurgical contamination was another problem. At one point, 80% of the delivered titanium for manufacture was rejected on these grounds alone. The high temperatures generated in flight required special design and operating techniques. Major sections of the skin of the inboard wings were corrugated, not smooth. Aerodynamicists initially opposed the concept, disparagingly referring to the aircraft as a Mach 3 variant of the 1920s era Ford tri-motor, which was known for its corrugated aluminum skin. The heat would have caused the smooth skin to split or curl, whereas the corrugated skin would expand vertically and horizontally and had increased longitudinal strength. Fuselage panels were actually manufactured to fit only loosely with the aircraft on the ground. Proper alignment was achieved as the airframe heated up and expanded several inches. Because of this and the lack of a fuel sealing system that could handle the airframe's expansion at extreme temperatures, the aircraft leaked JP-7, its special fuel made only for this engine, on the ground prior to takeoff. The outer windscreen of the cockpit was made of quartz and was fused ultrasonically to the titanium frame. The temperature on the exterior of the windscreen reached 600 degrees Fahrenheit during a mission. Cooling was carried out by cycling fuel behind the titanium surfaces in the chines. On landing, the canopy temperature was over 572 degrees Fahrenheit. The red stripes featured on some SR-71s were to prevent maintenance workers from damaging the skin. Near the center of the fuselage, the curved skin was thin and delicate with no support from the structural ribs, which were spaced several feet apart. And the Blackbird's tires, manufactured by BF Goodrich, contained aluminum and were filled with nitrogen. They cost $2,300 at the time and would generally require replacing within 20 missions. The Blackbird landed at over 170 knots or 200 miles per hour, basically the speed of a top speed Lamborghini, and deployed a drag parachute to stop. The chute also acted to reduce stress on the tires. So if I can, can I start off with your name? Brian Shule. Brian Shule. And when were you flying the SR-71? 83 to 88, 1988. I was there at Beale Air Force Base. I had about 500 hours in the jet and uh, flew uh, worldwide missions, uh, spy missions in the airplane. Incredible. Went through the training and uh, I was with this uh, in love with the airplane as most guys were only uh, 90 guys in history got to fly the plane yeah so we feel pretty privileged now and i'm glad i was carrying a camera around when i was got the pictures i could do at the time just uh, so i've written some books on it and uh, have a collection of photos that are, are real special to me now you can never go back and get those now it's all retired no. that's what you're here doing today right yeah we, we we have uh, two really uh, unique books which are i'm proud to say the most popular books worldwide now on the jets in 48 countries because nobody ever did a uh, book on the jet that flew it and took all the photographs so right. it's kind of a unique project and uh, just something out of the labor love I wanted to do greatest airplane of the 20th century without peer you had to invent technology to build this airplane yeah. they did it back in the late 50s early 60s it's just an incredible accomplishment for what it did how long it did it and the importance that it had in winning the Cold War for this country. Yeah. People don't realize the uh, enormous impact this airplane had because it was so top secret and they weren't aware of all that it was doing uh, during its operational year. So. Yeah. Uh, were you working directly with the guys from Skunk Works or was it really more so? No, it, by then the, it, we were operational Air Force pilot. Yeah, in the 80s. We were, I'm, I'm not that old. I wasn't there in the <laughs> uh, 60s. 
we were operational Air Force pilots at okay. you know, flying, flying real missions, and uh, we did interact with some of the Lockheed tech reps. One of the great joys for me was in my second book after the jet was declassified, I got to interview about 20 of those guys that used to be in the hangar in civilian clothes, and you'd always wonder, who are those guys? They all had a story and a love and, uh, for this airplane like it was their baby, and they were on it for 15 or 20 years, some of them. Uh, it was just a, an amazing um, uh, process. Uh, so I got to interview them. They're all dead and gone now. And those guys took with them so many secrets and uh, the history of the plane that they were, you know, not allowed to talk about all those years. But in my second book, I have those interviews, and I've, it's the only book that ever gave them a voice. Which one is the second the one? The Untouchables. Uh, this one right here. Yeah. How much does it go for? These books, you, know, you go on the internet now. You'll see these books for five to six hundred dollars. Oh wow. We're selling them. At the air show here uh, for two fifty. Two fifty. Uh, but they're just real special. You can't get them in bookstores or right. anywhere. We, I, I'm the publisher, and they're immensely popular because there's no other there's no other books like that. And uh, they're all my own pictures, so it was just a labor of love. Um, and the, the, with the internet today, every I, I get emails from. Germany, France, Australia, Japan, weekly of people are just fa fans of the airplane. Yeah, everyone loves this aircraft. I mean, it's well, it's unique. It yeah. stands alone as one of one. What airplane can you say held every speed and altitude record when it was born and still held them when it was retired? Right. That's saying, saying a lot. It says a whole lot. For Kelly Johnson and uh, Lockheed and the way they built it. Right. I know, I mean, obviously when the training, they taught you a couple things about the aircraft. I know you say you're well, not an expert. Well, just a couple. Yeah, the, this is the front and this is the back. Right. I know you say you're not an expert on the engines, but... I'm not, but it was a year of training. Uh, okay. So, in, in, in very briefly, the, the, the real heart of the system, the reason that it could go and sustain Mach 3 was the inlet system. Right. Right. A pretty beefy boy J58 engine, but it's the inlet spike right. repositions the shock wave and through a series of doors and, and uh, levers keeps the engine fooled to think it's only flying about Mach 2. Uh, it's pretty complex the way it works, but it acts like a ramjet. You get a lot of free air around the duct into the burner section. But it's not a ramjet, it's a regular jet. Right. And people mistake that sometimes. But your your job as a pilot was to monitor the, these aft movement of the spikes as you accelerated to make sure everything was working right and how much air were you spilling out. And this was all in the climb and acceleration. Once you got up to altitude and the, the spikes were full aft, you were getting a like free thrust from the ram air and you were burning so much less gas. So the faster you went, the more range and the better fuel mileage you got. Oh, wow. Yeah, just backwards from other airplanes. Right. So it, the real heart of it, and I always recommend, the only other book I recommend in mine is The Skunk Works by Ben yeah. Rich. Because yeah. he talks about how they built yeah, it. Yeah, I read that book. Okay, then you understand. Yes. That, that's Impressive. the heart of it. It really every, is. Every Soviet... Uh, Aero engineer one could say we could build an airplane and go Mach three and all yeah for five minutes yeah and you burn it up right so they had to figure out a way to, and they did and they built it out of mostly titanium it gave us eighty thousand pounds of gas but a brilliant brilliant system that was very complex for its day and has never been duplicated right now you can build ramjets today and higher technology and all but what this did and how efficiently it worked for the for the technology was phenomenal. Incredible. This movable cone, is yes. that was that done automatically? Yes. Just based off of your airspeed, it's right? Based on, on airspeed temperature and altitude. But if you if they became out of alignment, they didn't move exactly, one was little you get that little yaw, yaw. moment. So now you're like a hydroplane on the oh, water wow. that goes and that's oh, no. what happened in the early days. They lost some jets. They didn't even find any pieces bigger than your finger. That's incredible. Because at that at speed, those speeds, right? Yeah. Disintegrates. So they had to they had to refine it a little bit, and we would get what we called unstarts. The engine didn't quit, but the spike start the start of the spike schedule was interrupted, and they'd go full forward, oh, wow. which meant drag, fuel, and you're, you're really wasting gas now right. to recapture the shockwave. And the and you would it would slam your head against them. It'd yeah. scare you basically. Uh, you'd wet your pants, going like, "Geez, I'm out of control here." <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, but you you learned how to manage the system after a while, to where you had less and less of those. Uh, did you have any close calls yes. flying it? Yes. Oh wow. That's why I write about it. In the it book, in yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs>
Um, thank you for sharing. I don't want to take up too much of your no, time. No, that's, that's thank you. I appreciate it. If, before I close today, I will share this little story with you that uh, people always ask me, was it ever fun to fly the world's fastest jet? And, I, and I've shared this story many, many years ago, and it became, a, <laughs> it became a cult classic on the Internet. So people send it to me. And I go, hey, <laughs> I wrote it. It's in my book. I'm the guy. And they go, no, no, I heard this really incredible story. I go, hey, I, it's my story. So I'm going to tell you, because you will see it on the Internet tonight when you, when you go on there. It's called the L.A. Speed Story. And I, it was just a story about one day it was really cool being, being SR-71 pilot. Walter and I were doing a training mission around the United States where you just were building up hours and time. And we take off out of Beale, hit a tanker in Idaho, rip on up to uh, Montana, zip across Denver, hang a right turn in Albuquerque, out over Los Angeles, up to Seattle, back into Sacramento, two hours, 21 minutes. And you just do that for, and then you do it backwards, and you hit a tanker. It was just, just to gain crew coordination, get, build your hours. We're on our last training mission. We're over Tucson. I can see downtown LA from Tucson. We're at 89,000 feet. I can see the whole western United States bathed in a warm October fall glow. I can see the chain of Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico. I could, I could just see the most beautiful picture laid at my feet in the air as smooth as glass. Not a gauge moving in the cockpit. It was perfect. Now I'm thinking, we bad. <laughs> and I feel sorry for Walter because he has to monitor five radios in the back seat. So I flipped the switch up just to listen. and. LA Center is controlling, they control all, when you fly Southwest Air, the guy's controlling everybody. But we're above controlled airspace. So they, they have us on their scope, but they're not talking to us. Now there's controllers all over the country, Jacksonville Center, Chicago Center, Seattle Center, you know. It's the same guy. They all talk the same. And it's really cool the way they talk, because they make you feel important as a pilot. They don't just say, yeah, okay, here's your thing. They make you feel really cool. So sure enough, this was pre-GPS day. Some Cessna guy has to know his ground speed. Uh, LA Center Cessna November Tangle Alpha, you got a ground speed readout for us? Now Center would like to say, who cares, get off free. <laughs> but no, he'll talk to him like he's John Glenn. Cessna November Alpha, we show you 90 knots, nine zero knots on the ground. And they do that sing song, but that's how they talk. And it makes you feel kind of cool. Right after that, a twin bonanza came up to pimp the guy for speed, I guess. And, L.A. Center, Twin Beach, uh, whatever. You got a ground speed readout for us? And Center likes it. God, it's Friday. Why me? God, please, just get off. Free. But he's going to talk to him like he's Air Force One. Twin Beach, uh, we show you 121, two, zero knots on the ground. And right after that, a Navy F-18 out of Lemoore popped up on frequency. And you knew it was a Navy guy because he talked really slick on the radio. Center Dusty 5-2 speed check. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Dusty 5-2 has a ground speed indicator and that million dollar F-18 cockpit. It's right there in the heads up display. Why is he calling Center to broadcast his speed? <laughs> uh, I get it. We have just the meanest, baddest, fastest military jet in the valley today. We're taking our little Hornet jet over Mount Whitney and ripping across Death Valley. We want everyone from Fresno to the coast to know what real speed is. And you can almost hear a little, a little glee in the controller's voice like, we have put an end to this. <laughs> Dusty 5-2, we show you 620, 620 knots across the ground. And it was that across the ground. See that little knife like, I hope nobody else has the nerve to get on frequency now. And there wasn't an airliner from Seattle to San Diego that wanted to be next on freak. It's sort of an etiquette thing amongst flyers. And a 12-year-old was reaching for the mic button. <laughs> And I thought, oh, no, wait, Walter's in charge of the radios. I flew single seat all those years, but I'm in the family model now. And I, I want it. No, it's the Navy that must die. It must die now. And I, <laughs> and I thought, no, but if I do, I, well, I will upset Walter, and I want us to be a good crew. And I, at that moment, I heard a click of the mic button in the back seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter and I became a crew at that moment. <laughs> in his best innocent voice, L.A. Center, Aspen 30, have you got a ground speed readout for us? <laughs> you could almost hear a collective gasp on Freak, like, oh, the poor fools didn't hear the previous transmissions. Oh, they, they got crushed like a grape. It's, it's just a pilot thing. But Center had to give you that same voice. Aspen 30, we show you 1,992 knots. <laughs> 
across the ground. <laughs> when I knew I was going to like Walter a lot is when he came back and said, Senator, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we did not hear another transmission on that frequency <laughs> all the way to the coast. The king of speed lived, the navy had been flamed, and a crew had been formed. <laughs> For just a moment, it was absolutely fun being the fastest guys on the block. Yeah, when I was coming over here, I, I told, uh, I actually told my parents, like, keep me on the time limit, because I didn't want to take up too much of you guys' time. <laughs> I know some people can come and just talk forever, right? We've Your had those, perfect, we've though, had those. Thing. That's good. We get guys that come in here and want to tell us their stories, and they, they don't leave. We just ignore them after a row. They come telling you their stories? Yeah, they say, well, I saw the jet run. I used to do this, I used to do this. They like, just okay. don't. They they do want to camp out in here, but we don't. We don't mind. We don't have any rules here. If we don't want to, tell them to get their booth down. That's street, right. right. If we don't want to listen, we just ignore them. Right. <laughs> Today the eighth. Alrighty. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing with me. I appreciate you. No, I'm happy. We're, we're happy to do it. I appreciate, appreciate it. you coming back. Absolutely. It's one less I got to oh, carry. Yeah, he's, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'll see you guys later.